So welcome everyone to the CCI COP26 outcomes and the road ahead. Um, today we're going to be talking about our team's experiences at COP26 um, and what the key takeaways are from this important conference. So the questions that we will be exploring today are first and foremost, what is COP26? Then how did the Citizens Climate Delegation engage at COP26? What was achieved? How will COP26 outcomes affect our climate future? And how do we build on this foundation in 2022? So now I'll turn it over to our director, uh, Joe Robertson. Thank you, Jess. Um, so I wanna give everyone a little bit of a background on the UN climate negotiating process. It's pretty complicated. And so this background is just meant to help you understand that complication. You know, in 1992, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was agreed at the Rio summit. Um, the mandate is to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So almost 200 nations have agreed since 1992 to work together to prevent dangerous climate change. And of course, we now know dangerous climate change is already here. Um, the Conference of the Parties, COP, is the conference of parties to the convention. That means nations that are signatories to the UN Climate Convention or the UN Climate Treaty. Um, there's one party that is not a nation, which is the European Union, whose member states are also parties. Um, the COP is actually five COPs. It's not only the COP itself, it's the same 196 nations plus the EU operating as the COP for the Kyoto Protocol, the COP for the Paris Agreement, and also operating as two subsidiary bodies. So in each of these five processes, all of those nations have to reach consensus, meaning none can object to the outcome. Now, it's important for understanding how we end up with the results that we get, but it's also important to understand for all of the difficulties that that process entails, this climate negotiating process has been tremendously successful. It has reached consensus every single time, uh, sometimes with much lower ambition than desired, but that has helped to make climate part of law at the national level and at the international level ever since 1992. Why was COP26 so important? Um, all 197 parties, the nations plus the European Union, they must make their own nationally determined contributions to implement the Paris Agreement. That means they get to decide how much they want to do to help end climate change. But other nations are allowed to encourage them. They can be encouraged in positive ways and also in negative ways. They can be punished if they're rogue actors, so to speak. Um, it's important that we increase ambition to prevent that dangerous interference, to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees centigrade. A big question for COP26 would be, will the nations of the world agree that 1.5 degrees is the danger threshold? That has been tacitly agreed in the past, uh, but an explicit agreement on that is very important for making sure everybody starts moving much more quickly. Um, the COP26 was both formally by the Paris Agreement itself and popularly by public opinion, by political processes, by activists tasked with achieving a major increase in that ambition. And the reason that is so important is that the most recent science report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from this past August basically tells us if we don't reduce global emissions by half by 2030, that's nine years, um, we cannot avoid persistent climate emergency. Uh, so that is why this is such a critical process. Now, there was a lot of disagreement about should the COP26 be held in person or not? Should it be held next year? Maybe we're not ready given COVID still being rampant across the world. Um, so what was done was they set up a very strict uh, process for making sure that the COP was a safe environment, relatively speaking. Um, and in fact, some people said you're most likely in the safest place in Glasgow, other than your own home, um, if you're inside the Blue Zone, the UN secure negotiating venue. Uh, and this is why this slide here shows you what our team had to go through, what everybody had to go through to be able to participate. 
you had to take a, a test every single day. Uh, if you tested positive, you had to self-isolate for 10 days. You could not attend the COP. You also could not go anywhere else. If your test is negative, you could go to the COP. And then, of course, you need all of your credentials in order to be able to enter. It's a very secure area. Um, sometimes that's an annoyance because it limits the number of people who can participate. It, it closes out activists and experts unless they're invited by someone who is accredited. But in this case, it was important that COVID safety could be achieved. If, if that wasn't possible, this event could not have taken place. These negotiations could not have taken place. And just a final point on the way the process works. I said before that each cop is five cops. This one actually had to do the work of 11 because we're catching up on a missed year and a half of negotiating time. Now, what did we do as a team? We had 15 badges per week. That's our most ever. Um, 23 total delegates used those 30 badges. Some had two weeks. Um, we had 33 team members in Glasgow representing 15 countries. Um, from those 10 that were not part of our own badge list, six of them had party badges, meaning that they were part of country delegations. Some of them were actually diplomats working in the negotiations. Um, overall, we had more than 50 bilateral meetings just with our core team, um, with leaders, with organizations, with UN institutions. We had meetings with 11 ministers or heads of state. That is more than we've had total at past COPs combined. Um, we, we did a pilot program for something we call the People's Pavilion. This is a way to try to open up the process. It comes out of our open COP work. Um, it's a way for people who are not present at the COP to be able to view what's going on, participate in discussions, engage with our team, engage with others. And there were 51 sessions live streamed through or covered by the People's Pavilion. Um, Isati Sintron, who is a board member of Citizens Climate International and also Latin America Regional Coordinator, um, she addressed the high level segment of the COP26 specifically on the subject of action for climate empowerment, human rights, and the need to include stakeholders' voices in order to raise ambition. Um, and then, you know, we kept a database where we tracked 310 contacts and leaders, 531 affiliated organizations, institutions, coalitions connected to those 310 people, and 237 events. Um, across all of those people and affiliations. So we had a very robust engagement and we're gonna be able to follow up in a serious way. Now, there were major new voluntary commitments made. The first week especially featured a lot of announcements of good things that will be done or that people intend to do. Um, and here are just a few of them. And I put them in this way so you could see them you know, we're trying to essentially build a wall against danger. We're trying to protect against out of control climate emergency. And in some way, these bricks can get us to that level of protection. They're not enough. No one is enough on its own. But if each of these really does go forward, we're much closer to being able to solve uh, climate change. And in fact, one analysis from the International Energy Agency said, if we, if we took all of these new commitments, and we added them up and they were real. They happened on a science-based timeline, meaning 50% global decarbonization by 2030 and everything else that these commitments are promising. That if we did that, we would already be in a position to limit global heating to 1.8 degrees centigrade. Now that's not 1.5, it's significantly worse than 1.5, but it's the best we've ever been in terms of where we stand in our chances of stopping a dangerous climate change. So just a quick run through. The Powering Past Cold Alliance now includes 168 countries. That's 168 countries that are voluntarily committing to move away from coal as fast as they can. Regen 10 is essentially a collaborative innovation coalition. It's aiming to reach 500 million farmers across the world to make sure that they through their practices, through their land use, and start to mitigate climate change by using climate smart agricultural practices. Um, the 500 million mark and the other targets of the Regen 10 initiative would be reached by 2030. If they are, that's a huge change in our ability to reduce and absorb carbon emissions. Um, 
the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, some people see this as the biggest uh, voluntary announcement, the biggest non-governmental announcement, um, although it does include a lot of governments. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero includes financial institutions, banks, uh, asset managers, but also sovereign wealth funds, central banks. Um, these major financial institutions controlling $130 trillion uh, in assets under management, that's what AUM is, $130 trillion in wealth. That's about one third of all the financial wealth on the planet is part of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. In theory, they have committed to a science-based timeline for decarbonization down to net zero. What that means is that they would have to reduce the overall net emissions globally by 50% by 2030 um, and fully by 2050. Um, now, again, and that's a net zero commitment. So the question is how fast, um, how credible, and how sure are we that what we measure today as, as a carbon sink isn't gone tomorrow. But it's an incredibly important thing. And we'll come back to the finance and whether that can be mobilized for real in a minute. The methane pledge, 105 nations to cut emission, global methane emissions 30% by 2030. More than 100 countries accounting for 91% of global forests, pledging to end deforestation by 2030 with $19.2 billion already committed to that initiative. Um, some from the public sector, some from the private sector. More than 100 nations, cities, states, and businesses have committed to a zero emissions transportation transformation. Um, the Clyde Bank Declaration is a shipping industry declaration, 19 countries signing up to create zero emissions shipping routes, where not only would the ships themselves and the routes they travel be conducive to getting rid of carbon emissions, but the places where they leave from and come into the ports would also be conducive to zeroing out the emissions of the shipping sector. Um, FACT, which is an acronym, is a green commodities commitment Countries that control more than 75% of global trade are committing to begin eliminating climate risk and climate impact from commodities systems. That means the way that we manage forests, the way that we manage land, the way that we uh, you know, make products that are going to cross borders, green commodities. Um, nature, people, and planet, multilateral development banks have committed to foster nature positive policy and investment. That means they not only want to help those they lend to avoid harming nature, they want to help them restore nature. Uh, that is a major breakthrough. In the past, multilateral development banks have been cautious about making that, that kind of commitment because they've seen their uh, responsibility for reducing poverty as potentially in conflict with their with the, the wider ethical responsibility to reduce harm to nature. And then aim for C, aim for climate, is a coalition of 30 countries, has major support from the United States, um, committing to accelerate sustainable agriculture with $4 billion in new funding. There may be some overlap with Regen 10 there, but there's no formal connection. So this is just a sense of all of these pieces put together, none of which are formally part of the Glasgow Pact, but they're all part of the picture of climate action. They all give us a chance to limit dangerous global heating. Now, the official outcomes, what's in the Glasgow Pact itself? This isn't everything, but just a quick run through. Uh, the Glasgow Pact is what you call the covered decision. The, the COP has to make legal decisions. Those legal decisions are essentially votes by the countries to collectively adopt some new legally important uh, idea or action uh, into international law through the climate negotiations. The cover decision is the main legal decision that sets out how all of that will be done. And the Glasgow Pact covers the COP, the Kyoto, COP and the Paris COP all together, the COP, CMP, and CMA. Um, it's the first ever global commitment to phase down the use of coal. Some people wanted that to be more ambitious, so did we, but it's a tremendous achievement that that was agreed by consensus. It is a global commitment to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. There is the question of what countries think inefficient fossil fuel subsidies means, but 
it is a global commitment to phase out those subsidies. And if we look to the International Monetary Fund as a reference point, their view is that fossil fuel subsidies are not only inefficient, but destructive as such. There are no fossil fuel subsidies that do not have that characteristic other than uh, efforts that help the poor afford a better quality of life. Um, but those subsidies are not necessary in a world where fuel, uh, combustible fuel is not the standard. Um, the Glasgow Pact frames the mandate of the convention, avoiding danger, as requiring rapid, deep, and sustained reductions in global greenhouse gas emissions, 45% by 2030, in line with the 1.5 degree centigrade goal. So it doesn't formally say 1.5 is the danger threshold, but it does say that. If you read the words carefully, it very clearly says, if we're going to avoid danger, we need to keep global heating to 1.5 or below. That is in line with the science, and the Glasgow Pact consistently references the best available science as the standard. So it does give us that 1.5 commitment. It doubles financial support for adaptation, or rather calls on countries to do that. It finally achieved a rule book for Paris Agreement Article 6, paragraphs 2, 4, and 8. That's emissions trading, the specific mechanism through which that can happen in line with the Paris Agreement. That's not to say that other emissions trading mechanisms can't, but there's a specific one that's paragraph four. And then what are called non-market approaches. I'll talk about that in a minute. It also calls on international financial institutions, those multilateral development banks and others, to consider climate vulnerabilities in concessional finance. That means in lending for development purposes or other forms of support, including special drawing rights. Now, for reference, special drawing rights, that's something that the International Monetary Fund is able to give out as a way to rescue countries from potential economic disaster. And they've upgraded their total SDR allocation the amount of money they can commit to that to over $600 billion during the COVID pandemic. So that, that is a tremendous potential increase in the overall amount of finance that's actually available for implementing the Paris Agreement. And then two additional points. These are not part of the Glasgow Pact. They are alongside the Glasgow Pact, the Glasgow Work Program for Action for Climate Empowerment. That's public information and climate civics. There are a lot of important aspects of what that work program will do. Some of our desired detail for how it can be implemented, how really robust local citizen engagement can be funded and sustained has to be uh, formalized in an action plan in June. But we have this foundation for recognizing and moving forward with this very important part of climate action. Uh, for the next 10 years. And then the Glasgow Dialogue, this is something that's been framed as a huge disappointment because the desire was for a fund for loss and damage. Countries that have suffered grave impacts and been you know, harmed, whose people have been displaced in huge numbers by climate impacts that those countries did not cause. There was a desire that funding be allocated to compensate them for that loss and damage. The Glasgow Dialogue uh, has been framed as we wanted a fund, instead we got talk. But the Glasgow Dialogue includes parties, but also organizations and stakeholders. So not only countries, but also affected communities, expert organizations, intergovernmental organizations, uh, advocacy organizations can participate in this open dialogue to help to shape the process of funding uh, actions to counter and to reduce loss and damage. Um, the question of whether that's going to include adaptation finance, building resilience, infrastructure, those kind of things, uh, that's still an open question. And there are people on both sides, the funding side and the recipient side, who have differing views about whether combining those things is a good idea. Our general view is we have to think about what is best for human beings and their situation and what is best for nature and what we're doing to it. Um, and then there's the justice issue. And now Article 6.8, those non-market approaches, I want to highlight this for a minute because it's a tremendously important breakthrough that we have rules within the Paris Agreement setting for action through non-market approaches. 
Article 6.8 basically says countries can voluntarily work together in any way that they want to, so long as it has environmental integrity, so long as they're not cheating, right, in order to enhance their overall capability for mitigating global emissions. That's a mandate of the Paris Agreement, overall reduction in global emissions. So I'd like to know if I'm going to act to reduce my own emissions, is my neighbor going to do the same thing? Or am I acting alone and then they're going to cheat by expanding their pollution while I reduce mine? Uh, that's what the OMGE standard is about, is making sure that when, when I act to reduce emissions, I am also acting to help everyone reduce emissions. Um, and so how do these non-market approaches actually change what is possible? They allow nations to cooperate for faster decarbonization. They signal the wisdom of policies like our favored climate income policy to set strong carbon prices. They make room for carbon border adjustments. Countries can act through carbon border adjustments to hold other countries to account so that it's not as easy to offshore pollution, meaning say, well, you've set a high price. I don't want to do business here. I'm going to go over there where they don't impose that cost on me. Through border adjustments, you're able to reduce the risk of that happening and incentivize businesses innovating and getting clean faster. Um, Non-market approaches increase the likelihood of, of an actual international floor price for carbon pollution. They recognize regulatory measures, things that can be done at the national level that don't have to be established through international policy, uh, but that mandate accounting, disclosure, and avoidance of carbon-related liabilities for investors, for institutions, even for communities. Um, they create conditions for climate smart nature positive financial instruments. That's a kind of non-market approach where investors can say, we only want to see things that are good for the climate, good for nature. How can we make sure that this investment does those things? That type of financial arrangement now has a lot more uh, solid foundation in the UN climate negotiating process because there are rules for Article 6.8. Um, those special drawing rights that I mentioned uh, now, this is a direct link to the Paris Agreement and how we fund climate action. It's explicitly mentioned in the Glasgow Pact, and it is implicitly part of the Article 6.8 uh, landscape of action. And then all of this expands our opportunity for mainstreaming climate smart finance. What that means is we shouldn't just be thinking of climate finance as a very specific type of money. We should be thinking about how all money can be good for the climate. Article 6.8 makes that much more possible because of these other things that are now tools that countries are going to become more interested in. Um, and then, you know, integrating science data into financial data is an implied outcome of the non-market approaches rules because you have to know whether the things you're doing have environmental integrity. You can only know that if you measure your actions against nature and science is how we do that. Um, and then the other piece here is something that a lot of countries have wanted to avoid for a long time. And this may be one of the reasons why it was hard to get rules about Article 6 for a long time is that existing institutions can now become engines for climate action incentives and enforcement. So for instance, the World Trade Organization could simply say, and has said this year, border adjustments are a good thing. Environmental taxes are a good thing. Use them to enforce your climate policy, not just within your borders, but also on your trading partners. When the WTO says that, the World Trade Organization or other international institutions recognize that that is legitimate, they become enforcement mechanisms. They have enforcement capabilities. And so we're starting to get to that place where the Paris Agreement now has what people have been calling teeth, a way to make sure that the change is real. Um, and now, just before I hand over, I want to highlight this very important meeting that took place uh, during the first week of the COP. The reason that this meeting, which looks, you know, maybe like a small gathering of people, it was a COVID situation, so they kept it small. It was viewed online. But the people who are sitting on that panel are the highest level ever panel of people at the COP to discuss climate income policies, border adjustments trade as a way to enforce climate action priorities, a floor price across the world through cooperative action. 
the uh, SDRs as a way to vastly expand climate finance and non-market approaches generally, even though that's in the Paris Agreement, we've never had such a detailed high-level discussion of what non-market approaches might mean for the climate as we had in this panel. This panel included uh, the head of a major uh, metals and commodities company, the head of a major cement company, managing director of the World Bank, managing director of the International Monetary Fund, the prime ministers of Sweden and Canada, Mark Carney, who's the UN Special Envoy for Climate Finance uh, and coordinated the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, the head of the World Trade Organization, and Ursula von der Leyen, who you see at the right speaking there, uh, who's the president of the European Commission. So again, this is an important moment because it's these leaders welcoming the kind of thing that we have been calling on governments to do for a very long time. And now they're doing it in the context of a COP which set new rules to make all of that possible. And now I just wanna hand over to Kathy to talk a little bit about the Canadian example, why Prime Minister Trudeau was able to talk in that segment, uh, in that panel about what Canada is doing and why it's an example of leadership. Thank you, Joe, for that. Um, as you can see, we are aware of the many, many climate solutions that are necessary to uh, for a livable future. And in Canada and many countries of the world, our lobbying focus is carbon pricing. So I'm gonna just focus on the Canadian example for a few moments. And I hope that this example shows you that our experience have smoothed the way forward and that we have learned many lessons. So what is the Canadian carbon pricing policy? On the other side of the planet, they call it climate income, but here in North America, we call it carbon fee and dividend. And we have a carbon, a clim, I'm going to say climate income from now on. Um, our cl we have a climate income like policy here in Canada. Starting in 2019, our government um, started charging a price on fossil fuels starting at $20 a ton. And next year, it'll be $50 a ton. And the plan is for it to go up incrementally by $15 a ton thereafter to 2030. So it's $170 a ton. And this is only in provinces that don't have equivalent carbon pricing. For those of us that live in provinces that get the rebate, um, you can see how much we get back here, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And we know that over 60% of families come out ahead. Additionally, our rural uh, households get an additional 10% top, uh, top up. Between 2019 and 2021, we got this rebate via income tax, but starting next year, we're gonna get four direct rebates from the government. And lastly, it is revenue neutral. 90% of the money is returned to households and 10% is returned to what we call the mush, which is our municipalities or cities, universities, schools, and hospitals. So there's this consumer price, but then what do we do with our heavy industries in Canada? Currently what we have is what is called output-based pricing system. So it's a cap and trade for heavy industries uh, like program, but there's no cap. And they pay a price, but it's a smaller price. And it does encourage uh, best behaviors within those industries. So going forward, our government has promised that they will study border carbon adjustments or, or uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms. And last March, so in March of 2021, the government of Canada, uh, the permanent mission there at the World Trade Organization held a half day long seminar on border carbon adjustments in preparation for probably the, um, probably in preparation for the European Union, which will be enacting border carbon adjustments mechanisms starting in 2023. So that is our carbon pricing uh, policy here in Canada. Next slide, please. So how do we make it happen? I'm not gonna read all that stuff on the left. I just want you to know it was a heroic effort um, by many Canadians. And uh, what we did is what, what we were told would work. We documented everything. So when we went to see a politician, we could say, hey, we got like 340 letters to the editor published in the last six months. We sent out action sheets every single month like clockwork without missing a beat. And these actions were based on what our volunteers and what politicians and what experts were telling us what to do. We pulled relentlessly on the five levers of political will, which is basically all the ways in which we create political will. And if you're trained, you know exactly what I mean. 
And we submitted countless documents as citizens from across Canada to the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change between 2016 and 2017. I think this was really key. Um, the, our government asked for massive feedback and we gave it to them. And in, after doing all this work in October 2018, we were on Parliament Hill for the 13th time and we were told we were gonna get what we were lobbying for. So very exciting times. And that's how we made it happen. And I hope um, that you, what you take home from this slide is that we've smoothed the way forward. You don't need to work nearly as hard, but we've learned some lessons. So let's learn what those are. Next slide, please. Oh, forgot about this. These are just some of the heroes. Many thanks to all of them, politicians, volunteers, our all the NGOs that supported us, um, helping to make this happen. Your unconditional loving of this planet and our country and yourself and your children to make this happen is what made it happen. Next slide, please. So what have we learned uh, since climate income became law? Uh, well, twice our government uh, got reelected federally, which was great. Uh, these next two components I think are really important um, to consider when you're trying to build political will for your country to enact carbon pricing policy. Canada was a founding member of the World Bank hosted Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. And this is a place where they learn from each other um, and support each other in building carbon pricing policies. And by they, I mean governments, uh, as well as NGOs, as well as business and industry. As Additionally, through the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, we learned that all stakeholders must be uh, consulted when developing a carbon pricing policy or any policy that's going to transform our world. So I think number two and number three are like some of the take-home messages from how and why we were successful in Canada. As I think... Um, if, if our communication experts would say the way our government has crafted some of the words uh, for uh, our carbon pricing policy uh, have been brilliant. We talk about pricing pollution and making polluters pay. Um, one of the things that perhaps made it really hard for us on the first couple of years is that we got our rebates via income tax and most people didn't know they were getting it. So we are looking forward to in 2022 getting actual rebates from the government physically and not in our income tax, which is, you know, a hidden line in our income tax and most Canadians don't even fill it out. They usually get somebody else to do it for them. Um, we, we feel that that's going to really help create the political will uh, for uh, ramping this carbon pricing policy uh, price upwards because we're going to get bigger checks as time goes by. And for somebody of a family of three here in Ontario, like myself, that's $10,000 between 2019 and 2030. And we can plan around that. Now, one of the little pushbacks that we get often, especially early on, but I really see um, that has transformed in the last couple of years um, is we need to look at tax reform to pay for the low carbon transition. So a lot of times people will say, we should take that money from carbon pricing and put it into programs. But if you do that, you can't ramp the price up very high because you're making the taxpayer pay for the transition. That you know, tax reform in general, so looking where you can start you know, make taxes, every country is going to be different, can help pay for the transition. You don't need to use that carbon tax, um, that carbon pricing policy money collected to, uh, to pay for the transition. There are other ways of finding money. And lastly, our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is empowered. He, um, he, he said, just as we have agreed to a minimum corporate tax, we must work together to ensure that it's no longer free to pollute any way air around the world. That means establishing a shared minimum standard for pricing pollution. And he said that at that meeting that Joe was uh, just showing you. And yes, I see your message. Mark said a, our local MP was quite instrumental in helping us, uh, and many MPs were quite in instrumental in Canada and in getting us that actual rebate check coming back to us. So that constant relationship building um, is necessary. Okay, next slide, please. And from an activist perspective, we've learned the politicians need our help. They get a lot of pushback and they're kind of 
I, I don't like to use such a word uh, like so I'm going to just say metaphorically they're bullied they're bullied a lot so how do you help somebody who's, who's being a bully being bullied you be an upstander so um and so we help like run interference we stand behind them we you know they need our help to do this and this helps create political will locally they need people to stand with them when they're doing this work um for countries with direct representation representation of their lawmakers for building political will um, at the grassroots level, one constituency at a time is, is necessary. Um, so countries like Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, um, the USA, and I, uh, some of the African countries where we actually uh, directly elect our, our representatives, I think that the, the formula that we have um, for building political will at the local level is really necessary. The first thing I got when I began Citizens Climate Lobby Canada was a compelling document um, in 2010 that said document everything. And nothing um, empowers or worries a politician more than highly organized volunteers. So going to them with you know, your exact numbers of how many people you've lobbied or how many letters to the editor you've written really um, empowers them to know that you are, you are doing the work. Um, you have to, another thing that was said to me in the first couple of years is you have to be more than an internet group. You have to have conference and lobbying days. And that could be just as small as three or four of you going to your Capitol uh, Hill in whatever country you're in and, and just going and talking to politicians. That was what we did literally uh, 10 years ago this week in, in 2011. And we went, uh, a small group of us went um, and just tested out the waters and then eventually um, ran our own conference and lobbying days. Uh, celebrate every success um, because there's, there's a lot of uh, back and forth, but you are making progress. Uh, be prepared for pushback when the policy is announced. So celebrate uh, when you get that policy announced, but do brace yourself because you're going to get pushback. As well, the policy will not be perfect on the first iteration. There is so much the Canadian policy needed to, to improve upon. So in 2018, um, we, you know, after we looked at the policy, we hoped for it to rise to 20, 2030 instead of 2022. Our government did that. And we asked for that. Um, we asked for at least $210 a ton. They got to 170. Um, we'll keep working on them. And um, we wanted those dividend checks back and we wanted them to study border carbon adjustments and we wanted uh, more uh, studies being done on harmacy of policies across Canada. And they, when they made the next iteration of their policy last year in 2020, they pretty much followed our advice. And I just wanna say that outside the USA um, and, and in general around the world, there needs to be more uh, funding for uh, groups that do effective organizing at the grassroots level, because this grassroots education is key for success. Last slide, please. This is really important that citizen engagement and grassroots support are key for policy implementation. And it is actively aligned with Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, Action for Climate Empowerment. So your work you are doing in your countries is so key for your governments to be able to do this. And in fact, it is written right in the Paris Agreement. So thank you for all of you doing that work. And lastly, and it's a something, a, a mental exercise I encourage all of you to do on your own or bring it back to your groups. But we did an exercise in the spring looking at the climate income policy and we, um, looked at the SDGs and we uncovered that the climate income policy impacts positively on all 17 oh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I am done, so thank you for that. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, just to follow right on from what Kathy has talked about, uh, I'd like David Michael, uh, if you're with us, to say a few words about Nigeria's Tr lobby training and lobby day, which happened right before the COP26 and is a historic uh, moment in our overall organization's growth. All right, thank you. Um, so, um, Kati said, we they tested the waters in Canada and we also wanted to test the waters um, in Nigeria. And I'm, I'm very happy that I have had opportunity to attend uh, one or two lobby 
uh, sessions in the US, Capitol Hill, and that experience greatly, greatly came to play here in Nigeria. So um, we gathered uh, volunteers from across Nigeria, 25, uh, and then we had a training on the five levers of political will, and uh, more importantly, how to lobby sharing my experience or using my experience um, that I've gathered over the years lobbying at the Capitol Hill. So we headed out the next day to the Nigerian parliament, uh, but very importantly, we had um, one of our volunteers who worked at the parliament and uh, we, we made him more like uh, our Lysine who helped us to secure the necessary uh, permission because that's the, the major difference between the US parliament and uh, what happens here in Nigeria. In the, in the Capitol here in the US, I know you needed no permission, you just walk into the Capitol here. But here, before you get into the National Assembly, as we call it here, you need permission and security clearance. And this took us close to one hour before we got into the parliament. And it was very exciting for most of the volunteers, especially the young ones who have never in their life come very close to the parliament. And then we set out to some of the very important uh, members of parliament that we identified. And then um, we shared ourselves into groups and then we got in to test the waters. And then we are able to have four very good meetings, very good meetings, I repeat. And um, it was, um, I don't know how to describe the feeling, uh, but it was a very great experience, not for me, but for all the other volunteers. And the good thing is that immediately uh, after the, the lobby day the next day, we started getting phone calls from the members of parliament uh, requesting for follow-up meetings. So right now we've had like five follow-up meetings, <laughs> which we are still working on how to, you know, to get back uh, to them um, with something on the table. Uh, and the good thing that one of the senator we lobbied, who is the Senate Committee Chairman on Climate Change, was, was at the COP. And um, one of our volunteers, uh, Gloria Bulus, was able to set up a meeting between her and Cathy Orlando. And uh, I mean, it was just very fulfilling for me seeing the senator and, and Cathy. And Cathy, uh, one of the things he promised to do and what we requested for was that they were going to ask the president to assent to the climate change bill, and which they did. The president actually last week assented to the climate change bill. So it's, it's a lot of win-win um, situation for us. But then um, at the moment, we have a situation. Uh, the Nigerian uh, executive uh, just a few days ago announced that they will be giving out cashbacks uh, to citizens, uh, they will remove subsidy from uh, fossil fuels from uh, the sale of uh, PMS as uh, a petroleum metro uh, uh, spirit, and and they will be giving out the money back to citizens. And uh, this is very close to what Cathy shared as the climate income, climate fill, and dividend, and um, not exact. So it's an opportunity for us. Um, the CCF volunteers here in Nigeria. I, I am just a volunteer here in Nigeria. Uh, Joseph Ibrahim is a national coordinator and I know that we're working very hard to make something happen. And so for those of you who are from Nigeria and are on this call, just watch out for us. You'll be, you'll be contacted in a few days. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, David Michael. What a wonderful uh, story and example of leadership and the fact that uh, Kathy and Gloria were able to meet with one of the lawmakers at COP, drawing that connection between your national lobbying and the intergovernmental process is one of the things we've been working to achieve for a long time. So we're very happy that this was able to happen. And of course, looking forward to your follow-up meetings. Um, you know, 
when you see all these moving pieces and you see how important citizen engagement is for making this real, um, I think it helps to explain why we've identified what we're calling science activation as one of the goals of citizen engagement. So we have our policy goal, but rather than simply explain policy or educate the public or help lawmakers to understand and to act on good policy, rather than just translating science insights into something that people can understand better, there's a question of how much a society actually puts science to work to fix this problem. And over the last year and a half, as the COVID pandemic has played out, and we've looked at the question of reinventing prosperity so that all stakeholders can benefit, activating science insights, making them part of lived experience so that our local policy, our local infrastructure, our local governance systems, our civic spaces are all attuned to what nature is telling us we need to be able to do to keep ourselves safe and to be sustainable. Um, this has emerged as one of the areas of action where citizens acting locally, talking to local government, talking to lawmakers can actually help to make significant change because a lot of these people don't have the expertise themselves and they don't have it on their teams. As, as Kathy said, they need support from society itself. They are serving us, but they can only do that effectively if we are all working together, essentially, to make their service as effective as possible. So over the next year, we've mapped out a few opportunities on the road to COP27, where we're going to work to make sure that we move forward, not only on climate income, not only with the organization and coordination of our volunteer groups, but also the other areas of our COP agenda, civics, the engagement space, finance, also investment in nature and transforming food systems, helping farmers be more part of the solution. All of these things that we want to do on the road to COP27 are really oriented to one basic idea, which is, again, what Kathy said before, help. Provide help. Make it easier to make national policy strong by making solutions more common, making them more local, making them more of part of our everyday world. And that entails citizens getting in touch with decision makers and keeping them focused, keeping them moving forward. Um, I just want to share one more thing from our engagement at COP. This is a, uh, a tartan, a traditional Scottish uh, textile that we designed uh, at Citizens Climate International in order to represent our engagement at the COP in Scotland. Um, and the reason we did that was because it provides such a great opportunity to show how human influence is woven throughout our relationship to nature. Um, you've got the deep blue of the ocean, you've got the blue of marine ecosystems and waterways, watersheds, you've got the, the green of land-based ecosystems and life on land. Uh, you've got the light blue of the atmosphere and the white of the cryosphere, the world's icy places that have to stay icy in order for the climate to be stable. Um, we, we put this together so that we would have a way of saying, you know, part of the human role in engaging in this kind of space is to try to make sense of this complexity, to take all of that interwoven, uh, you know, multi-system geophysical interaction and turn it into something where we're simply trying to get it right and keep things uh, sustainable. Uh, so, you know, in the coming year, we'll be using this image, um, you know, sometimes in what we present or in the way we communicate, but also uh, to just celebrate what all of you are doing as uh, citizen volunteers. So um, I know we have some time for questions. Uh, Jess, do you want to uh, take over and, and moderate a few quick questions? We'll try to be really brief in our responses. Yeah, uh, thank you, Joe. So um, if anyone has questions, you are welcome to either post those in the chat um, or raise your hand for us to unmute you. While we're waiting for a question, can I just say one hopeful thing that I heard at COP? Is that okay, Joe? Of course, go ahead, Kathy. 
Um, I went to many sessions, but one session I went to was with uh, team uh, with was with fine with regards to the finance minister's climate uh, umbrella group that has developed internationally. And one thing one of the eco economists said that gave me so much hope is the following: that progress on climate policy and humanity's response to this climate emergency that we're in will not be linear. Mm. I think you got it. I see your face. Thanks. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we do have one question in the chat um, from Keith McNeil. Uh, what is the difference between market-based and non-market-based solutions? Sure, that's a great question, Keith. The simple answer and our preferred answer is that a market mechanism is a system for trading emissions and a non-market approach is everything else. Um, so carbon taxes, mm. tax reform, exactly. subsidy shifting, mm. finance, trade policy, all those things would be non-market approaches. There are some people who believe that anything that uses the everyday economy to make change is a market approach. So some people think of uh, market meaning um, you know, finance regulation, uh, economic incentives, and all of that. Uh, but the simplest and the clearest and the one that most directly reflects what's in the Paris Agreement is uh, market mechanism is an emissions trading system, and non-market approaches are everything else. Yeah, I, I agree. Read carefully those those clauses, and they're literally only a paragraph long, and it and it clearly de delineates that that it's it's really clear in the Paris Agreement what it means. Do we have any other questions? Oh, David Michael, I see that you've raised your hand. Yes. So this question is for is for Joe. Uh, Joe. Um, we have a lot of people from the global north on this call um, and the feeling especially for many people including me uh, post cop um, very saddening i would say um, we strongly had a feeling that the cop did not live up to our expectation um, so what advice would you have for CCI volunteers uh, going into 2022? Because at the moment, our spirits are down somehow, some way. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you, David Michael. That's, you know, I mean, for those of us who were there and for those of us who were coordinating remotely, um, when we saw some of the closing hours, taking away uh, elements of the Glasgow Pact that people really cared about, it was very disappointing and emotional. Um, and it is absolutely right that um, vulnerable countries, especially, but also many developing countries um, are still being treated very unfairly by this overall global process in the sense that um, resources have not yet been made available at the level necessary to make sure everyone has a clean economic future. Um, I would say this, the single most important thing for all of us to do, and I think that especially includes those who are facing more climate adversity now, uh, is if you can talk to people in government, if you can talk to your community, if you can talk uh, through newspapers and other media, um, try to find ways to make what we have already established more real. Meaning there are some things in the Glasgow Pact that are disappointing, but they are still foundational for very powerful steps forward. And so it's going to be up to advocates uh, and stakeholders to make sure that we get high ambition out of those promising elements. Um, otherwise, they're just going to be disappointments. So in June at the mid-year negotiations, there's an opportunity to turn 
what might just be conversation into real mobilization of finance. Uh, at the COP27 next November in Egypt, the same. That's all going to be easier if your instruments of decision making in the public sector, your city governments, your county governments, your national governments are talking about how to make the climate smart economic future, your country's economic future. Um, the amount of finance that's becoming available is absolutely unprecedented. There will be more climate related finance mobilized in the next year than probably in all of history combined. Um, that is an opportunity. And again, we're in a situation where the world is structured unfairly. So we can't fix that immediately. The best thing that you can do as citizen volunteers trying to talk to government is try to make sure that the things we have that are already institutionalized, that are already agreed, try to make sure that those are solid foundations for making these commitments real. Thank you, Joe. Um, we do have one last question um, in the chat. If you feel like you have time to answer, um, it's a nice segue into the answer or from the answer that you just gave. Um, what specific preparations um, is CCL doing to support its volunteers in successfully implementing the outcomes of COP26? I, I can start to answer that one as program director. So we we have ongoing training, We uh, depending on what part of the world that you live in. Um, so if you live in Africa, uh, David Michael, um, he, he uh, you know, develops plans with you to help you push forward. Uh, the types of training that we give are how to talk to your politicians, how to work with your media, how to how to work with social media, anything you think you need in order to make to help your country move forward um, is a, is the type of training th that we will provide as well. Um, we have a reputation on the international you know, internationally and nationally, many countries. So using our social capital um, will help you gain uh, access to your, your governments. Um, so ongoing training is, uh, is, is key. And um, yeah, I, I, I'd like for others to pop in if they may. I'd like to say a lot of it will come from your, your national leaders. You know, it's you know, Canada. Canada did this work without CCL USA. We ran our own conferences. We ran our own fundraising. You know, you just got to come up with a plan. Like, how how can I go meet my government? What realistically can I do? You know, even you will be surprised if you go talk to politicians in an organized way using our methodology. How much they love you. I. I'll never forget my first COP I went to in um, 2017, and I went to the Nigerian Pavilion, and um, I was the only, it was a seminar from the World Bank, and other than the person from the World Bank, I was the only non-white person in the room, and I was speaking on David Michael's behalf through, like, he was asking me to ask questions on the phone, and afterwards, one of the ministry came, people came up to me and said, we need your group in Nigeria to reach out to us. Like they desperately want you. So just know that you are wanted and we can help you um, train people to do this work and empower them. That's that's key. Uh, you, you will be so amazed. Um, and it's fun too. Yeah, Kathy, um, thank you for mentioning that. And I think that one very important thing is that you need to belong to a group. You cannot do this work all alone. Uh, you need to belong to a group. Most of our trainings are done through the different groups. So it depends on where you are. We have different groups in, in Nigeria. I'll be dropping my, my email uh, in the chat box. You can reach out to me and then I will direct you to uh, the closest group uh, where you can sign up to and then we take it up from there. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy and David Michael. 
Um, I know that we're over time, but we do have um, one last question. Um, Yawan, I see that your hand is raised, so I'll go ahead and unmute you if you would like to ask your question. Um, unfortunately, if you are speaking, we cannot hear you. Um, so you can try putting your question in the chat um, or try muting and unmuting yourself again. Um, do we have any more questions before we wrap up the session today? Catherine did ask one. Oh, okay. And, um, on the last official day of the conference, there are two uh, plenaries were being held, one with the actual COP parties and then one with the observers. So I was in the observer plenary, it's called the People's Plenary, and what happened was we we held we heard speeches from the various official uh, bodies that report directly to the secretariat. So, so there was one speech after another about disappointment. So and so and then surprisingly they got us all to hold this really long rope, and about a thousand of us marched through the entire halls of the cop. And I was having fun actually, like punching in the air and stuff like that. And three microphones got put in my face. So you probably heard my disappointment because it actually got televised <laughs> in many parts of the world. And it was on the internet as well. So yeah, I, I do this work because I care deeply about the poor and women and disabled. And like from an emotional standpoint, it was really hard. And I needed to let my anger out. And I want you to know my anger came from love. Okay. So I love so deeply. And I'm going to honor that. And I honored that in that moment. I am hopeful. Don't worry. And I'm going to work even harder in 2022. Thank you. Well, thanks as always for your passion, Kathy. Um, oh, I see that Yawan has posted his question in the chat. Um, Nigerian president demanded for $100 billion annually to ensure a climate-friendly environment in Nigeria. So after the passage of the bill, what is the way out for Nigeria? Um, David Michael, would you like to take this one? Uh, uh, thank you, Jess. Um, <laughs> so, well, um, how best do I answer this now? Yes, um, the Nigerian president and indeed every other developing countries and other countries in Africa all are asking for the climate finance. Where are all those promises? Um, yeah, we need investment and we need all of that. The, the COP just ended. And um, we're waiting to see the next steps, the actions, if some of those promises will be fulfilled. So I think um, it's a bit early um, right now to, to say either um, those funds will be given to Nigeria or, or not. Um, and then which of the funds, there are, there are several others, the Global Environment Facility, the Global Climate Fund, and, and, and me and so many others. So um, we're hoping that uh, the new variant of COVID, which is taking the world by storm again, will not slow down every other thing. So we just have to be expectant and then watch and see. And as Joe said, the June um, conference or meeting is very crucial. Um, so I th think we, we just have to, to watch and hold the global north countries by their promises. Thank you. Thank you, David Michael. Um, I am not seeing any more questions in the chat and I am not seeing any more hands. So I think it is safe to say that we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, Kathy, is there anything that you'd like to add before we end? Thank you everyone for being here and, and celebrating what we've achieved. And I look forward to working with all of you in 2022. Great, thank you. 
Um, thanks again, everyone, for attending this webinar. Um, we appreciate your continued support and everything that you do for the climate movement. Um, if you have questions, as always, you can reach out to Kathy or David Michael or Joe. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Bye, everyone. <laughs>